Mae Brussel, who for over 17 years has investigated and exposed political conspiracies worldwide. World Watchers International originates at KLRB Carmel, California. Here's Mae. Okay. We start over? Yeah. Good evening. This is Mae Brussel at Carmel, California. It is broadcast number 539, April the 4th, 1982. It is not the machinery is off. Off. If you hear a raspy sound, it is my voice. I was down in Los Angeles all week, caught a cold, or what I like to think of as a psychological cold that I might throw off by tomorrow or so. It was really chilly down there, and it affected my throat. So once again, you have to bear with that and uh, listen to that sound. Interestingly enough, uh, Ronald Reagan's going down to Barbados to be with Claudette Colbert and spent his Easter vacation down there. And it was her husband, Dr. Joel Pressman, who did the two surgeries on my throat. I might have mentioned this before on this program at UCLA. He did one surgery about 27 years ago and another one about 18 years ago on the vocal cords. If uh, Joel and Claudette knew what I was saying now, <laughs> maybe I wouldn't have those vocal cords. But anyway, let's get back to the matters of the tax, the service, the internal revenue. It's time to mail in this week. If you're listening now or you have mailed it in or hopefully will mail it in soon to the government for paying your taxes for 1981. Every once in a while, I don't know how often it is, I read on the air to new listeners the statement I sent with my taxes exactly 10 years ago. I sent in uh, my taxes, the internal revenue, to the state taxes and the federal taxes and with those taxes I sent a letter asking for a refund uh, from the government and those of you who are familiar with this bear with me because there's a lot of people who pick up this program continuously, new listeners, who are not aware of what May Brussel was doing 10 years ago. So April the 15th, 1972, after I sent in the taxes and with them, and that was two months before the Watergate arrest, I sent in a letter for the Director of the Internal Revenue, Dear Sirs, enclosed as my tax form, accompanied by my payment of taxes. Below the form, and you'll notice on your form there is a space where a refund is requested, you notice I've marked that area and now request from you a return for the amount being paid. To support the existing government in any way is to give approval to legalized murder and assassinations of our former president, John F. Kennedy, civil rights leader, Martin Luther King, the anniversary whose death is today, April the 4th, and Senator Robert Kennedy, a candidate for the election in 1968. For nine years, I have researched extensively these particular murders, as well as those of members of the minority races, searching for their share of American opportunities. And I went into my documentation, which I said was extensive, and my cross-filing and the work and the examination at that time, this is 10 years ago, of over 300 books on political assassinations, espionage systems, and State Department history. Now, very few people were doing that three months before Watergate. And I know, I put in the letter, how murders are planned, who planned them, what banks were used, and where the guilty reside. There are secret societies existing today to perpetuate the wishes of a handful of extremely wealthy and powerful persons. And before the election of 1972, their names should be exposed. Among those is the Lincoln Club in California, a secret organization behind President Nixon. The National Archives contains proof of the conspiracy to kill President John Kennedy, the arbitrary date of 75 years to examine Kennedy's code or x-rays or the evidence is too long. I'm familiar with the dirty games that the Internal Revenue plays in the scheme of things. Therefore, I'm not appealing to your reason, I wrote. In the matter, I simply tell you that I wish my money returned because part of that money is going to be used for your budget of secrets that are locked up in the National Archives. The taxpayers pay between 60 and $80 million a year out of the budget for the archives for a classification system which is only necessary to conceal from the citizens what is really taking place. The Freedom of Information Act means little to the Internal Revenue. 
In tested cases, they have already turned it around and kept the information concealed. Now, I wrote that in 1972, and as I mentioned last week on this broadcast, in 1968, before Nixon was even in office, and in 1970, the German military intelligence came to our national archives to get volumes of indexes of the Nazi connections to people in Germany, Kurt George, the Chancellor, Kissinger, the Chancellor of Germany, and I wanted them to know that I didn't want to pay to guard the archives because the archives locked up what I needed to know to prove what I knew already was existing in 1972. Then I enclosed on that claim for refund, there's a section there, attached is the letter that went off with my tax payment explaining why I want a refund. In addition to that information, I have other reasons. The Treasury Department, through alcohol, tobacco, and firearms, do not serve people of the United States. They hire convicts eligible for parole to commit crimes if they were released from jail. They hire assassins to kill labor leaders and civil rights leaders. They offer immunity from arrest for persons on drug violations and other criminal charges if they will kill, assassinate, plant evidence, infiltrate organizations, Prime targets are black and Chicano groups who meet for legitimate purposes, not as criminals or anti-Americans. And of course, as I say, I got back from the Internal Revenue on one form and also from the other form a letter, the reasons given for your claim are not considered valid and your claim for refund is denied. That was one letter I sent with one set of taxes and the other one was dated May 18th exactly one month before the Watergate arrest. Now, I was writing about murderers and assassins and the money coming out of the Treasury Department. And then right after Watergate, we had the scandals of uh, Jack Caulfield threatening to kill James McCord, of Tony Lasowitz being up at Chappaquiddick, the Dorothy Hunt plane crash, and I can go into some of the Watergate um, murders related to Watergate that these people were doing. And G. Gordon Liddy, was brought to the Treasury Department, the alcohol, tobacco, and firearms, by Gerald Ford, who was on the Warren Commission. Now, I didn't know all that. I knew more. I knew about the killing of the U.S. Attorney Robert Meyer in Los Angeles after his talk with L. Patrick Gray, the U.S. Deputy Attorney General, and Gray went on to become the Deputy Director of the FBI until it was divulged that he was destroying evidence. And I knew about the activities of these people to hide the counterintelligence of provocateurs at the Isla Vista riots in Santa Barbara or the killing of Ruben Salazar in Los Angeles, um, the Chicano writer who had come back from Southeast Asia and was working for the LA Times. Now the other letter I wrote in May, a month before Watergate, said, Dear Sir, Sirs, enclosed is the form requesting a refund of my paid taxes for the years of 1971. Many people are presenting their tax cases to attorneys in objection to the Vietnam War. To my way of thinking, this is to my way of thinking, 10 years ago, Vietnam is a small fraction of a major sickness. The United States of America was overthrown by a coup d'etat November 22, 1963. The killing of President John Kennedy was done for the purpose of maintaining power in this nation that was tightened with clandestine controls following World War II. Nazi generals, scientists, makers of war machines and ammunition were located in this country with the help of John Foster Dulles, Secretary of State, and Alan Dulles, the director of the CIA. The state, and he was on the Warren Commission too, later appointed the Warren Commission to find out who killed Kennedy. The State Department and the intelligence agencies combined energies to relocate their Nazi headquarters in a tightly controlled enclave at Tyrol in Jamaica. Now, I wrote this 10 years ago, and Tyrol was in the society section of the Washington Post today, and the Monterey Herald, Betty Beal, the uh, entourage of Ronald Reagan and all the who's who and what's what in Washington, go to Tyrol Bay, where the Nazis met after World War II, to plan their control of the world and now reagan is going to the caribbean to wipe up that little nest and then sandwich them between the fascists of south america and america i wrote in this letter john Connolly, former head of the treasury department until this week is a member of that group 
The National Archives contains proof of this conspiracy. The documents are locked there by the conspirators. Now I was talking about the Nazis and the relationship of Nazi generals to John Foster Dulles and Alan Dulles and John Connolly. And interestingly enough, the Nazis had come to the archives to empty them up several years before, but I didn't know it when I was writing this to the Internal Revenue. I wrote the tax pe that people paid, support a budget of between 60 and 80 million dollars to keep the documents locked up. I had that in the other letter. And then I continued, a democracy needs few secrets. Uh, all reports and evidence on murders such as John Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, and Martin Luther King belong to the people. The Treasury Department hires political assassins. The Justice Department manipulates their trials so the real facts and evidence are never exposed. The executive branch locks up the existing evidence of the conspiracies, conspiracies by order of the executive. The Treasury, the Justice, and the executive. And in conclusion, I wrote, my taxes would be used to pay public servants to dig our graves. When the proof of the escalation of the war is exposed, this is going on in 72 and it's still continuing, political assassinations will have been a major factor in allowing our Nazi, racist, barbarian behavior. And as I say, they wrote back to me, uh, account number 549326484, the claim for refund is disallowed, disallowed, the reasons given on your claim are not considered valid, and your claim for refund is denied. Now, a few years after that, I wrote an article for Midnight, the Globe paper that's on the stands at grocery stores and drug stores and at the airport. The Watergate cursed 30 key witnesses met violent deaths. And this had to do with various people who had information about Watergate who were killed, 30 people that were killed because of what they knew. And I had accused this group of being assassins and murderers and uh, carrying on the murders through the Treasury Department, alcohol, tobacco, and firearms, as well as through the prisons. And so it goes. It's 10 years since I wrote that. I didn't get the refund, but the record shows where I was at the time and where I am today, and it's been a continuous path of trying to expose these people. Now, many of you saw 60 Minutes tonight and saw the um, Mr. Powell talking about the experiments on Americans in Japan and the germ warfare and how we brought the scientists, the Japanese scientists, to the United States and used his experiments on biological warfare and didn't prosecute them. Uh, they said we prosecuted the people at Nuremberg, at, at Nuremberg for the Auschwitz and Dachau experimentations, but I don't really think we did. Most of them got off. There is a book out on this subject. It's a bestseller in Japan on the atrocities. It's called The Devil's Gluttony. And the important thing is that while they were showing this on 60 Minutes, they had a large segment. They didn't bring out the point that I made about five, six, or 10 weeks ago on KLRB. The point I made was that the people that Mr. Powell wrote about in the Journal of Atomic Scientists who approved of the experimentation who were willing to uh, bring that material to the United States and not prosecute these people and gleams of information from this wonderful bacteriological warfare. Those people were linked to Douglas MacArthur and the United States Army. And I referred to that book, American Caesar, by William Manchester in 1979, it came out. And in there it tells uh, on page 184 how Sir Charles Willoughby, the intelligence advisor to Douglas MacArthur, whose name was Carl Wiedenbach, W-I-D-E-N-B-A-C-H, thick Teutonic accent like Mr. Sonnenfeld or Fritz Kramer or Henry Kissinger, another German admirer of Franco, was the man who told them in Fort Dietrich, Maryland, go ahead and use this valuable information and gave approval to use it. The thing that is missing out of 60 Minutes uh, is the connection of people who took aliases as like Englishmen who were actually Germans or Nazis as the chief of intelligence for the United States long before the war was over. He was the advisor to MacArthur in 39 as the intelligence chief. 
were two of the largest scandals going that have never really been exposed in book length material are the Nazis that left the concentration camps and took Jewish names and disguised themselves as Jews and were placed all over the world to continue the anti-Russian propaganda and to praise and laud the Germans and to pass themselves off as Jews. And I believe, of course, I've said many times that Henry Kissinger is this one of these people. And the other one is, um, besides impersonating, the Jews is impersonating people such as Sir Charles, who isn't any Sir Charles at all, but a Carl Widenbach. And to find out, I don't know if we'll ever know how many people took away the Germanic names and took other names so that they would be acceptable as advisors for universities, hospitals, news media, and so forth. And it's important thing to know that it was common to change their names so that after the war, while we planned the next war, we wouldn't have so many Germans running uh, the scene in the Pentagon or in Navy intelligence or in our intelligence agencies. Now, one of the most uh, dangerous articles I read in the past week, and there were a lot of them, I have hundreds of articles to share with you, was the intent to build a fake White House for the Secret Service. The Secret Service wants $10 million to construct a city street, a shopping center, a cluster of mock houses for training, but they want several hundred thousand to have a White House, the exact duplicate of the Oval Office, the East Wing, the Lincoln Bedroom. I wonder if they'll put the ghost in the Lincoln Bedroom or the Ch Nancy Reagan with her china closet. Somebody wrote about that. A mock White House is horrendous. They want a Hollywood-style facade of the White House and Blair House as a training center uh, and to simulate people going in and out. Now, what is the problem with having a front, a set, where this actor president is there and you have these buildings where you simulate these uh, scenes of the Secret Service? The Secret Service goes through a per certain screening, which certainly didn't save John Kennedy or stop the bullets from flying into Ronald Reagan, but they have a certain method of studying security in the White House, and the White House should probably be the easiest place to secure. You don't need a mock front. But if you were fortunate enough to see the movie on the murder of Salvador Allende and how the army stormed in and took the palace, or you read the Pentagon Papers how uh, Diem was murdered in Southeast Asia and taken out of the palace, and there's a palace coup, when you have a group of people that think they know what is good for the government, the army, that think that the government are too patsy, they're too soft, that we don't need a democracy. And again, this comes up, uh, I'll go back to a quotation from the book on Douglas MacArthur. When you have people that think that they know what's best for your country, uh, or General Westmoreland talking about the curtailment of freedom, once they have that diagram and it's disseminated in Defense Intelligence Agency, the Marines, the uh, National Security Council, and so forth, the wiping up of the coup of 1963 will be a fait accompli. Just give them a model of the White House so they can storm in. If they think we're too soft to various governments, they'll storm in and take the White House. And uh, the scene that took place in the movie Missing, I tell many people, is the United States 10 years from now. We have private troops in Florida and Alabama in Mississippi. We have private armies getting ready for this and training to kill in New Mexico, in Colorado, armed to the hilt and very well trained. And they can storm in and have a palace coup that will be more overt. But the point is that the floor plans and the drawings were made available to them by the very people that have allowed these other things to happen so that they can do it very nice and clean and make it look like they stormed in sun suddenly where they actually have the plans to the White House. In this book on Douglas MacArthur, the quotations referring to Mr. Willoughby, Carl Wiedenbach, were copied from that book and mailed to me by one of my researcher friends in the East. And there's a quotation of a man that worked with McCarthy and Willoughby in uh, Southeast Asia, Lieutenant Colonel Richard Sutherland, and he said, that Americans should abandon democracy in wartime, that Congress wasted too much time debating, that elections should be abolished and a dictatorship proclaimed. And that was the mentality of high military going back to 1939 and 1945. 
So I'm sure they haven't lost that frame of mind. And keep in mind that, that while some people treasure democracy and believe in it, there's other people that don't think it'll work and we'd be glad to see it over. There's too many different kinds of people here and too many people to support, to educate, to hospitalize, too many people to get your dar your guard dogs to watch so that they don't come in and take what you have if you have so much. And the point is that this mentality was prevalent in the late 30s. Uh, there was a plan to seize the White House, a book on it, the plot to seize the White House. And this the idea has never left. So to put up a structure of the White House with all the doors and rooms to me is horrendous. Uh, I certainly wish that this would be stopped, but people have trouble recognizing we already had one coup, coup, and so they can't even think of the dangers that would happen by disseminating this information. Now, there was a problem with the U.S. attorney down in San Diego that you might have read up last week, and this, again, it goes very deep into the way this country functions, and I brought the, uh, the article that was in the New York Times and also... Uh, left out of many other papers. It was written by Philip Taubman from the New York Times, but I didn't see it in local papers out here. And there's a two-pronged problem going on all the time. Very important information that should be disseminated to everybody is excluded. And the minute I see an article and I realize that it's important, I look to see how it's disseminated. And nine times out of 10, the most important stories are not coming over the wire service. What that means is that if the Associated Press, the United Press, don't pick up the story, most newspapers around the country don't get the story. A lot of people believe, as I believe when I started my research, that everything I read was shared by people all around the country. This is not true, and it depends on the newspapers that you take to get the information. Well, the New York Times has an article, Ex-Mexican Officials' Prosecution in Theft is Halted because he was a CIA contact. And it's about the Justice Department has blocked the indictment of a Mexican in San Diego because he worked with the CIA and was a key American intelligence source in Central America. U.S. Attorney in San Diego, and he was appointed by Ronald Reagan, William H. Kennedy, wanted since last November to, block, to prosecute this man because he was involved in an $8 million ring of taking automobiles out of San Diego down to Mexico. And he worked for the Central Intelligence Agency. His name is Miguel Nasser Haro, H-A-R-O. But he also was the chief source of our information about Fidel Castro working in El Salvador and Guatemala and about the Cubans and the Soviet Union working with guerrilla forces in Central America. Sources asked not to be identified said Nasser passed on to Americans sensitive information about, so pardon me, about Soviet <coughs> Cuban and Central American guerrilla forces. Now, <coughs> you have a problem. The CIA says, look, we know he's implicated. We know he's no angel, but you have no choice but to use this kind of information on Central and South America. This is a double-barreled question that we should ask ourselves. Are these the only kind of agents we need to tell us the Cubans and Russians are in Central America? I mean, is this man saying this so that he can continue his $8 million swindle? <coughs> Pardon me. The prosecutor in San Diego said that he thought it should be stopped because American insurance companies, car insurance companies, are causing inflated prices. The cars are being stolen. 600 were stolen in Southern California and taken to Mexico, sold at inflated prices. More than $8 million was involved. Now, if a man is making an $8 million hit on 600 cars and he was seen with stolen cars, wouldn't he lie to keep the operation going? Is his information accurate? And that's a very important thing to think about in terms of how we get our information because the CIA claims he's so valuable. 
But if we can't get any more information about Russia and Castro than from this kind of person, how can we believe him? You know, at the time of Abscam, the argument was that the men involved in trapping Senator Williams and the other people, the men were criminals and you couldn't believe them. We'll apply this to the Central Intelligence Agency in Central America. We're using criminals. Can you believe them? Now, this Mr. Harrell began, he was the head of the Mexican intelligence. He was the former chief of Mexico's Directorate of Federal Security. He had a big job, and he was our most important source of Mexico and Central America. And now he's a suspect in an $8 million stolen car case. So <coughs> would this person lie, as I said, or his $8 million deal, that then next year would be 16, and then it would be 32, and our cars would be stolen and shipped down to Mexico in exchange for him telling Alexander Haig what Haig wants to hear, or Mr. Hinton and the ambassador of these countries telling us what they want to hear. They have him over a barrel because uh, he has them over a barrel because he's providing the information they want. And what happened when this story came out? Well, Ronald Reagan wants to fire the official who leaked it. He doesn't want the person in office, uh, the U.S. attorney, who leads the story? Now, I think the way to clean up this country is to get rid of the official who uh, is working for the CIA, who is a criminal. If we have a budget of $22 billion in intelligence, Army, Navy, their franchises, National Security Council, <coughs> if we can't get better information than this sort of person who is a criminal, who's the director of the Mexico uh, police and security system who's also involved in these swindles, then we ought to forget our information. Remember how Alexander Haig brought up the fellow from Central America who testified under torture that there were Cubans or Russians in Central America. And then he brought up a map to show that these installations that were built for future uh, military problems. And then it was proven that Somoza had put these in or ordered them when Somoza was in power and they didn't come from Russia or Cuba. I think that the reason that the national press, the Associated Press, and most of the newspapers aren't carrying this wire service story on Mexico is because of the other scandals that fell through and they can't keep making the State Department and the intelligence system look as bad as they really are and they're even worse than they are. Now, this story came out of the New York Times, March 28, 1982, and in the San Jose Mercury, the same date. But according to this story, he was fired, the CIA man was dropped off while the investigation was going, and he stopped doing his work. This Miguel Nasser Harot stopped and left his post in January of this year, of 82, as is liaison between the CIA and the Mexican Security Agency because um, of this new development of exposing him and the investigation going on since November about the stolen cars. Now, I have an article that many of you might or might not have seen. Again, it didn't get over the wire services. It's from the Mexico City Bureau to the San Jose Mercury. And this is about some deaths in Mexico that were so macabre I didn't want to put them on the air until there was a real reason to see why they would take place. And now I'm convinced that the reason was that it would tie in to the chief of the Mexican security who works for the CIA involved in the car swindle who could be lying through his teeth about the causes of our having to arm and intervene in Central America. This story, and you might have read about it in your local papers, you might not, is called Mexico's Macabre Mystery Deaths. Police baffled by 12 mutilated bodies found a in a canal. Now, the bodies are located in El Salto, which is north of Mexico City, towards uh, the Mexican border. It's not too close. But 12 men were found, and their bodies mutilated, and there was speculation of a political motivation. And the reason I think it could be linked was the sophistication of the murder and the techniques that are used on these men were used at Colonial Dignitat in Chile, by the same CIA people, Michael Townley and the Nazis down in Chile that were found with these men. The 12 men were 
found dead. There's no identification, no word from worried families. Nobody wants to identify them. No passports, no IDs, no billfolds. All lack of identification was gone. They're not peasants. They said they had shoes, expensive shoes, like $80 a pair. They didn't look like politicians either. They all look alike. Uh, they said they're not narcotic dealers. They don't have that look. They were killed within hours of being found. One man had a triangle cut across his chest where the heart had been, had been taken out. Several had their throats slit. Two were decapitated. And then the article said whoever did it had to be insane. Arms missing, burns all over their body. Okay, now back to part two. I forgot to tell you when we were on part one that when I came to KLRB this evening, there was a telephone call from a woman who read the article, the San Jose Mercury, that I believed Hitler was alive, that I, different sources had told me that he was alive. And the article mentioned KLRB and Carmel, so she called here. And she gave me her name, and she asked me, uh, do you really think Adolf Hitler is alive? And I spoke with her on the telephone, and I gave her the reasons why uh, I believed it and the information that I was told, and that I didn't take it lightly, that it was highly possible, and particularly since the new evidence of Eva Braun not having died in the bunker, and we were told she died, and Martin Bormann being dead in Germany, and now we find out he's alive. And Hitler so carefully planned the last two years of his life that there's no reason uh, why uh, he couldn't be alive. And I told her about his birthday party in Brazil and the sources of information I had on that subject. Well, she gave me her name, and she talked about her uncle, and she told me that her uncle is Adolf Hitler, and that's why she wondered that she's his niece, and that uh, she I'm going to get in touch with her. She gave me her maiden name, her first husband's name, and then the second. She lives up in the San Jose area, and she has pictures of herself. Uh, her mother was a sister of Hitler's mother, and uh, she has pictures with Adolf in 1928. That's the last time she saw him. She's lived in uh, Chicago from 1922 until just last year. And she told me about uh, her uncle. She called him Uncle Dolly. I guess that's for Adolf. That was Uncle Dolly. And uh, this is his niece. And she was interested in what I had to say. She wasn't surprised. And so I'll get in touch with her. I'd like to see the pictures. And she was interested to know if she could possibly find him if he is alive, and I thought that uh, that was an interesting telephone call. You know, if you take information and you do research, you put it in the pos, you know, in the category of possible or impossible, and where do the sources of information come from? And you put it aside in folders and think about it and throw it out to new people investigating the same thing and hopefully uh, get information from other people. If you think it's impossible, or if you believe every single thing you read, you never can come to the answer of some of these questions. There were doubles in many instances uh, throughout history, current modern history. And as I say, this was so carefully planned and written about so many times about his survival and my access to people who told me stories about it that... Uh, I believe that it was possible. So I'll talk to this woman. Her first name is Josephine. And we'll talk about Uncle Dolly. And hopefully I'll get to see the pictures of her when she was little with him and uh, maybe learn more about him. I'm sure she knows plenty about Uncle Dolly. Now, the Time Magazine, March 29th, 1982, just last week, speaking of Uncle Dolly, had the review of a book that I mentioned. I mentioned the play that opened in London that was so controversial. The play is called The Portage to San Cristobal of A.H. San Cristobal, down South America. <coughs> Pardon me. A.H. Adolf Hitler. And this is a book that was written. I thought it was just a play that was being produced in London. It's taken from a book by George Steiner. And the ad adaptation of the book is by Christopher Hampton. He was doing the play in London. It caused such a consternation. 
And the idea in the play is that Adolf Hitler was found in Brazil and that the people there who closed in on him realized that they never could get a hearing or a trial, so they gave him a trial in the jungle to hear what Adolf Hitler had to say. And the last 20 minutes of the play are supposed to be <coughs> defense of Hitler, ch actually challenging uh, what he thought in his mind he was doing. Then it's up to you, the audience, or the person to come up with something better and think about it because the idea is still alive. Time Magazine, March 29th, 1982, uh, has a book review of the Portage to San Cristobal of A.H. by George Steiner. It's published by Simon & Schuster. The lead article in the book review is Teaching the Grammar of Hell. The idea asked in this review or in the book that is thrown out to people is what would happen if the Jewish Avengers such as Simon Wiesenthal, good luck, uh, were really to find Hitler? Uh, as I say, Martin Bormann and Eva Braun and others are alive or left Germany well and alive. Hitler would, he was born in 1889 and allegedly died April the 30th, 1945. He has an anniversary of his birth and death this month. And the book is about the great powers of Europe who really don't want to find him. And this is, in fact, true of Martin Bormann, Joseph Mengele's, and many of the Nazis living in South America. And they said that Paris doesn't want Hitler because they'd be embarrassed to expose the role of the Vichy government in going along with Adolf Hitler and selling out France. The Germans don't want him because the government now is filled with people who worked with Adolf Hitler and they don't want jurisdiction over him. America decides that they'll send in somebody to interview him and they send in a television crew which is syndicated and they turn out to be from the CIA. <laughs> Wouldn't you know? So the play and the book are about the idea of language, the use of language. How do you arouse people? How do you speak to create something good? How do you speak to destroy something good? And the hypnotic trance that Hitler had in his use of words, how he turns them around to his own use and how the intelligence agencies would like to silence him and either pick him up and silence him, kidnap him, or sell him and make a package out of him to sell. I guess we'd have Adolf Hitler t-shirts and Adolf Hitler bookmarks and roller skates and lunch boxes, okay? So his long 20-minute defense of himself is the last word in the play, and that's it. Now, this George Steiner who wrote it was a refugee from Hitler. He lived in France, and he said that he grew up in New York and saw a picture of Adolf Hitler looking like a beggar, and nobody was listening to him. And then 10,000 people were listening, and then a million people were listening. And that the language of Hitler uh, got people aroused so that later it was millions. And uh, this book that goes into the problem of recreating the things that Hitler did to get the people around him. And he says that he's very concerned for his own family, his own children. He said that Hitler could not have done what he did without everybody else. And this is absolutely true. And I'm not talking about Gentiles or racists or the Falwells or the fall far right. I'm talking about the Jews. The Jews allow Hitler and uh, put him where he was. The Germans allowed it. And the Germans saw in him what they liked about their history. And this author said, I'm very involved in the idea that those who were destined to be at the highest level of intellect were going down to the bottom of mankind. And I'm trying to teach my children the sense of vulnerability and keep them in training for survival. Now, it's awfully hard to train your children or my children for survival if they don't want the training. You can only tell them what's happening, and it's so abhorrent that they pull away and hate you for it sometimes. Some hate you some like you, but they are very threatened by the choice of having to do something, of speaking up, of being different. It's an interesting idea, the play. What would you do if he were here? Uh, that he is located in Brazil. How would you react when you see him? 
on who wants him and uh, what role does his words have that could repeat again to arouse the kind of excitement that people had in him. I think his total abandon of everything except what he wanted at a time where there wasn't any way to handle this huge threat of communism and the monarchies wanting to be back on the throne and the bankers being afraid that they'd lose their money if socialism took over. Everybody was so threatened of losing money and investments in the empire, the British Empire and the French expansion and the uh, Spaniards in South America. What if everybody took control of the means of production for themselves and for their own health system and for their own education? There would never be that super high elite to dictate that would, that would make them separate from the masses. And it's very hard to visualize yourself separate from the masses. There was an Archie Bunker scene this evening where he was had some Puerto Rican family of the woman that he liked over for dinner, and she was so disgusted, and she said, just try to go out every day and look at people and think of them as equal to you, that you're not better, but that they're all equal. And Archie Bunker said, well, I can do it one by one, but not all those people out there. There's no way that I can give up that idea. So... The subject of Adolf is not going to fade away. I was writing about it 10 years ago in my taxes. I bring it up every week. And I think until the writers and the thinkers of this country, the people who oppose weapon systems and wars and beheadings and mutilations and the kinds of things that are going on, until people figure out where it originated and how the strength of it came through allowing those people who tortured, who experimented, whether it was in Japan during the war, in Germany, or in South America today, or Central America, with the sterilization of people in California and our mental hospitals and prisons. Until we begin to change our way, the way we look at these things, we are going to have to go back to the formation of Hitler and the Nazis, who very nicely can dispose of these masses once they get in control again. I don't think people realize what formidable person this was or with the brilliance of his organization. It was just in April of 1940 that Hitler uh, attacked Denmark and Norway and in Belgium right after that. And then Holland, and he went to Holland in, in 1940 and said, would you give up and become German? And it hadn't since 1795 or a time period like that. And they were ready to surrender and say, yes, we'll be German. And he was going to bomb Rotterdam. And they said, okay, we'll be German. So he decided he'd bomb it anyway the next day. And 175,000 people were out of homes. And then he began to shift another 150,000 to Germany in slave labor camps. Uh, he did, you know, he said, uh, become German and we won't do it. And then he had the total power and did it anyway. And nothing impressed the people so much, I guess, as that strength. So he just took all of Europe, Eastern Europe and Western Europe, and, and could go through and control these people. And this had been very carefully planned. Now, are there plans that careful to take the United States piece by piece? And has it been operating for 40 years? Yeah, I think it has. And I think it's working. And I think... Every article that I read fits in to the intent. The intent was there before. It worked. So why not try it one more time? Speaking of Richard Nixon and Watergate and, and the 1972 era where I didn't want to pay my taxes, that was the month before, or get the refund rather, the month before Watergate, there were several articles about poor Richard Nixon and his library. They're try, it's sort of a traveling library. It should be books on wheels. They tried to get it into Independence, Missouri. You might have read that. And some people in Independence were just horrified to think that they would try to pull the Nixon Library next to the Harry Truman Library. An article in the Washington Post said, despite Truman's remark that he didn't think Nixon even knew how to tell the truth, the librarian there or the city officials said they believed the late president would have welcomed the Nixon papers. But other people said to have it a half a mile from Harry Truman's home is horrendous. The Truman Library is in Independence, Missouri, and to put the Nixon Library a half a mile from there is horrendous. 
Well, I look back now, and I don't think there's that much difference between them. Harry had the atomic bomb. Harry allowed Alan Dulles and the Nazis to come to this country. Reinhard Galen, 1945 to 47, to form the CIA. When he was out of office, he said he had created an American Gestapo, but he let uh, Herbert Hoover and the powers that be from Germany uh, come to this country and make it. He knew where the war criminals were or weren't. He knew about Project Paperclip and the importation of Nazi war criminals into every state that we have here and the modeling of the CIA after the German Gestapo. So Harry Truman uh, gave the permission to drop the atomic bombs and he allowed the National Security Council to be formed and the uh, National Security Advisor and the CIA. So I think it's kind of fitting that we put Nixon and Truman next to each other. I, I really don't think that's so bad. But a few days after that article, there was one from the L.A. Times and from the AP Wire Service you probably saw. April 1st, Leavenworth may be the Nixon Library home. Now, that's really cute. That's getting closer. See, many of you are too young to remember who listen to this program that Leavenworth, Kansas, was always the home of the prison. And when we used to talk about Leavenworth years ago when I was growing up, we talked about Alcatraz and Leavenworth. Those were the two most notorious prisons in the United States. So Crook Nixon may end up at Leavenworth. After all, he didn't go to jail for the Watergate, but the presidential in Le library in Leavenworth would be pretty neat. That's where it belongs, and maybe that's where it'll go. There was a St. Patrick's Day party, a gay crowd at the uh, uh, White House. Maybe you saw the Washington Post. There was a picture of Ronnie. Top of the afternoon, they had a little party list, St. Patrick's Day parade. And they met the Irish Prime Minister, and I'm sure uh, you'd love the guest list. I won't read everyone who was there. They had a luncheon with George Bush and various people, um, some of them that were interesting. What I saw was J. Peter Grace, chairman of W.R. Grace. That's the fellow who was appointed by Ronald Reagan for this new committee with um, deciding on cutting down domestic expenses which is really reducing to slave labor. He's the partner with Otto Ambrose, the Nazi war criminal. Uh, Peter Daly, U.S. ambassador to Ireland, naturally. Senator Edward Kennedy was there with Mr. Grace. And Senator Paul Axalt, the guy from uh, Las Vegas, Nevada, with his interweaving mobster connections and finance campaign manager, for Ronald Reagan. There was John Lehman Jr., Secretary of the Navy at Barbara Lehman. That's the host of the Sons Pantaloon parties in earlier days or maybe present time. Edwin Meese, the presidential counselor. Jeremiah O'Leary, who's become the assistant to William Clark. Jeremiah O'Leary was from the Washington Star, the paper that went broke, but he was the pathological liar newsman who covered the House Select Committee on Assassinations for Public Broadcasting. I called O'Leary once and told him he should be hung by the heels like Mussolini for being such a pathological liar about what was really happening and about the evidence to kill Robert Kennedy, and John Kennedy rather, and how he was covering it up. And carrying on a dialogue of the testimony continuously on public radio that didn't relate to what was really happening in the room and when important things happened they were covered up and the unimportant lies were given the full coverage and of course there was William Casey of the CIA there at the party William Casey is uh, the fellow that worked with Reinhard Galen, Hitler's intelligence t chief and Lucky Luciano and uh, worked his way up to the director of the CIA with Vice President George Bush and William Clark, the new assistant uh, to the president. He's the National Security Affairs Advisor. Uh, he, I guess he came to the luncheon after be meeting with Mr. Schmitz, who said that Israel should be liquidated. He went to see his friend Clark, the man who's running for Senate from California. He went to Washington to see him before he went off to see the PLO and the Saudi, Saudi Arabians. He thinks the state of Israel should be dismantled, and William Clark from California is one of his good friends. The party, of course, is a who's who and what's what of all kinds of interesting names. I won't go down all of them, but I love the meeting of Senator Ted Kennedy in among all the thieves and assassins who killed 
both of his brothers. I mean, the guy doesn't blush about anything. I mean, he would go anywhere at any time, I suppose. I mean, I guess, is, is that how you stay in the Senate or get in the first place or if you want to run for president? But I would certainly wouldn't sit down with that mess of uh, people, and I would have more dignity and stay away and tell them why I stayed away. But Senator Ted Kennedy isn't known for his great dignity. Another article in the Los Angeles Times this week, ex-cop seeks order in the courts. Oh, boy. Now get ready. J.D. Smith, a cop who started his Los Angeles Police Department career, he, he had an incident that made him famous at the Police Academy graduation, a conservative law and order proponent, is appointed, has been appointed a judge by California's liberal Governor Edmund Brown, Jr. Now, he has now gone over the brink last week our liberal jesuit priest governor said we have to have the b1 bombers i mentioned this before on the radio because it's good for business and contracts in california now he has chosen a member member of the los angeles police department to be a judge and interesting enough it says uh, daryl gates chief daryl gates said this is the first time I've been proud of the governor of the state, and he suggests that he may be actually maturing. See, Brown has to get ripe enough to run for other offices. You can't just be governor of California. So in order to do that, he has to put a member of the Los Angeles Police Department, one of the most notorious police departments in the country, uh, emulated after, as Louis Tackwood said, the Gestapo. He has to put him as a judge to make decisions in California and down there maybe where the cases from the LAPD will come. I'm going next week to discuss the new appointment of a police chief in Carmel, California, who was with the Los Angeles Police Department and with Ed Davis and Evel Younger. It's very threatening to me personally because of the work I've done to try and expose the Los Angeles Police Department. So when they had interviews of 30 or 40 people and they brought one in to Carmel a very quiet town without too many problems and you bring in a member of the LAPD where they're notorious for counterintelligence racism and various activities working closely with people like Jim Jones and Ronald Reagan and the White House the Squad 19 and the counterintelligence agents such as Louis Tackwood when a man like that comes to Carmel, I feel threatened because if there were a crime or somebody did something to me, I've been exposing the police department that he's worked with for many years. So I'll talk about the new appointment here in Carmel. But this fellow now has been appointed as a judge. And the newspaper said, Los Angeles Times said, precisely how Reagan Republican J.D. Smith managed to be appointed by Reagan critic Brown is a matter of no small speculation. Some have suggested it serves the governor's expanding political interests, you better believe that, to appoint a few tough and law and order types. Others have noted that since Smith served as Gates' liaison officer to the judiciary, he knew virtually every judge in California and in this community, in the county and the judges. So, you see, the police department has a liaison officer to every judge, and you wonder how the courts get ever overturned or how the LAPD destruction of evidence, such as cutting off the coat of John Kennedy, Robert Kennedy in Los Angeles when he was murdered, or, or the ceiling panels from the Ambassador Hotel destroyed, or the scandalous behavior of Thomas Noguchi that never is resolved. The police department has a liaison to the judges, and the judges decide which way these cases go. So uh, it's very dangerous if the police department is in counterintelligence and is advising the judges. And then uh, now a policeman is on the court as a judge. So we have Ed Davis of the Los Angeles Police Department in the Senate of California. We have a policeman from the LAPD, a judge in California, and Evil Younger is still hiding, waiting for a big appointment. I don't know when he'll surface or why he's quiet for so long, but he will surface. I did see him when I was in Los Angeles the last trip, uh, uh, just before this one, and he was at the country club where my folks were and came up and gives my father a big hug. He was really drunk, or I thought he was drunk, or let's say inebriated in case he wants to challenge me on that one. 
If ever he would, I'd say he had one or two. If anyone saw him, there are a lot of people out there, you would agree. And I was just hoping that someone would follow him like they do Johnny Carson and some of these other people because he, I thought he was smashed. And it would have been very nice to see Evil Young or over there on Pico or Olympic leaving filled with a lot of good liquor. But uh, he's in the hiding. He's waiting. But now one of the LAPD people is um, working his way up, and he'll be a judge appointed, a Reaganite judge from the LAPD appointed by Jerry Brown. Another uh, way the LAPD is interfering into cases is that Mr. Vandy Camp, the district attorney down there, wants to throw out the idea that you can't hypnotize a person uh, on trial to recall their memory. Now, this is very controversial, and it will work several ways to the advantage of the police department to, if they hypnotize a person, they can tell them that they did the crime when they didn't, such as Sirhan Sirhan, who's told how he murdered Robert Kennedy in the place of Thane Caesar. The courts now say you can't use hypnosis, but then again, they can use that to throw out some of the mass murderers that have worked with the Los Angeles Police Department in the past so that they can get their mass murderers kicked out, uh, even the Manson type that worked with the police department if hypnosis was used, or uh, they're begging to get the hypnosis back because it's very instrumental in getting a patsy. If you use hypnosis in a criminal case, you can get a selected patsy and he won't know what happened or why he was there and can't remember anything, probably, for the rest of his life. Hypnosis is a tricky thing used in court because you can make a person be told he did a crime and he can serve for somebody else when he didn't really do it. You can hypnotize a person to get on an airplane. This actually happened by his best friend and put a bomb on the plane and give him another name. And then this fellow... Uh, collected the insurance and was picked up at his wife's home in Texas. This was about 12 years ago. If you want to pre reprogram them or deprogram them, there comes the element of uh, other people interfering with the planned selected patsy. Uh, hypnosis is a tricky thing. It is used in California. I don't know how much your other states carry it or use it, but it's tricky. And they tried to pass a law that you can't use hypnosis anymore to nail a witness. But Mr. Vandekamp wants to reverse that and use hypnosis. And uh, these controversial mass killers, I am convinced, were involved in a kind of hypnosis program. And uh, I don't know the way the legislation will go or whether it will be applied to specific cases to let them out because uh, that was the deal they were promised anyway. But... I, I think that the best way to judge whether hypnosis is used in a case is go to all the physical evidence first and see how it lines up. In other words, say if Robert Kennedy is murdered, and he was, and if the bullet holes come in back of them, and they, and they did, and if the fatal bullet came in back of his head, then you should be allowed, if the ceiling panels are removed, to show the trajectory from the bottom up, if a man was seen pulling a gun an inch from in back of his head, a security guard who fell to the ground after the sleeve is cut off and the shirt is cut off, when all that information indicates that the assassin was standing behind Senator Robert Kennedy in Los Angeles, again with the Los Angeles Police Department, then hypnosis should be used to find out who... Sirhan Sirhan really is. Of course, the court stops in, steps in and stops that. And Sirhan has begged to go back to the ambassador to see if he can recall anything because he can't remember anything. It's a very controversial uh, subject, I know. Well, our time is up now. I hope that you didn't pay too many taxes. Maybe you'll have the nerve to send in a letter like I did 10 years ago. I sent that in 10 years ago. I don't know how I had the nerve. I look back now. I don't know how I had the nerve to send it into the Treasury Department because there was G. Gordon Liddy and Mr. Colfield and the whole gang. But I guess ignorance is bliss, and I meant what I said. The facts were true, and I knew there were monsters there, and later, a month or two later, they were identified.
But that's the way it goes. And this year, I'll just send what I have to without any messages. And I guess my message comes out once a week on KLRB, and we'll suffice it with that because I'm not going to reason with those people anyway, so we'll just share it with each other. In the meantime, take care of yourself. I'll try to get rid of this cold and the scratchy voice, and I'll be back with you next week. This is Mae Brussel in Carmel, California. This has been World Watchers International with noted conspiracy investigator Mae Brussel. This program originates from Carmel, California. At KLRB, Carmel.